So now let's look at the Z transform. Now, we started off with the Laplace transform and we knew that the Laplace transform can be used to solve differential equations. Now what we do then is we would transfer the differential equation into the S domain and in this S domain it would become a simple algebraic equation and we just simply needed to manipulate the algebraic equation and once we've manipulated it and got it into the form we want, we could then convert it back to the time domain. Now, the Z transform is a discrete equivalent of the Laplace transform. Now, in the discrete domain, we don't have differential equations. We have difference equations. Now, the Z transform allows us to solve difference equations in a similar way that Laplace transforms allowed us to solve differential equations. If we had a, 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 different, a difference equation, we could convert it to the Z domain and then we could algebraically manipulate it in the Z domain. And once we got it in the right format, we could then convert it back to the time domain. And that would give us a solution to our difference equation. Now I've got a couple of examples written out here, so they are not written out in full. So you don't need to worry about going through the full example, it's just to give an indication. So in the Laplace transform, we would be using the S domain. So let's say, for example, with this differential equation here, dx by dt minus 8x equals 12. And we had initial conditions when x equals 2 uh, at t equals 0. Now we could convert that into the S domain, so the dx by dt became sx bar minus x0 and the minus 8x became minus 8x bar and the 12 is 12 upon s. Now this is now in the s domain. We now manipulate this in order to get it into the correct format and then we can then inverse transform it back to the time domain and this gives us this solution here. So this is the solution to this differential equation and we've done that using the Laplace transform. Now in the Z domain, what we would happen is we would have a difference equation. So here's an example of a difference equation here. So our value y of n plus 1 minus 3y of n equals 4. Now don't worry too much if you don't understand this. We will be going through a few examples later on in the course. Now if we had the initial condition y equals 0 uh, and the value of n ran from 0, 1, 2 off to infinity, then what we could do is we could change this from the domain it's in at the moment and we could move it into the z domain. So in the, in the z domain, this becomes z times y of z. The minus 3y of n becomes our value minus 3y of z. And we've got our other value here, 4 is 4 upon z minus 1. So what we've done is we've manipulated this in order to get it in terms of our value of z and then what we can do is we can then transfer it back to uh, the original domain in which case the solution to this is the y of n equals minus 2 plus 3 to the n plus 1. So this shows us that we can use the z transform as a discrete equivalent of the Laplace transform. Now again, don't worry too much about the example here. We'll work through a few examples in later videos. It's just to give you an indication of where the Z transform fits in to the whole pantheon of transforms. Now the Z transform is not a new transform as such. It's simply the discrete time Laplace transform, which has been mapped from the rectangular complex plane onto a polar version of the complex plane. So this is a mapping here from the rectangular complex plane to the polar complex plane. Now the vertical lines here in yellow are lines of constant sigma. So here we have our value, the i omega axis would be the value at sigma is equal to zero. And let's say that could be sigma one, two, three, and so on and so forth. And on the left hand side, it would be minus sigma 1, minus sigma 2, minus sigma 3. So these 
lines here are mapped to the circles of constant radius, R. Now the I omega axis here occurs whenever sigma is equal to zero, and that's going to occur at a point where R is equal to one. So that would be this little circle here, which was seen partially in pink. So everything to everything on the outside of this circle would be values of sigma greater than zero, and everything inside the circle would be values for sigma less than zero. So equally spaced lines of constant sigma, which are these vertical lines, are going to be mapped to exponentially spaced circles in the Z plane. Now, a thing to note here as well that these concentric circles here are not linearly spaced, they are exponentially spaced. So the further we go out, the, wide, the more widely spaced the circles are, and the closer you come into the centre, the more tightly spaced the circles are. The horizontal lines here are lines of constant omega, and these are mapped to the radial lines. Now, if we were to look at the value omega is equal to zero, then we would be on the sigma axis. So this line here, which is our sigma axis, would be given by the first radial line here. Now, when we go up in the omega axis to this line here, this maps onto this line here. And then the next one would map up onto this line, and this one here we map to this line here. Now whenever we get round to this point here, then we would be on to the next line, but the next line here would be just again the very first line, because we would be going back to the beginning of the period of this repeating function, so it repeats in the omega axis. So Anything outside this line here is just a repetition of what we had before. So we're really only interested in uh, what we have between uh, these, this line here and this line here. So that's going to give us everything all the way around. And everything outside here, again, would just be mapped on. And everything outside underneath here, again, would just be mapped onto the circle. So let's look at the mapping mathematically. We start off with our discrete time Laplace transform. So f of s is the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of f of nt e to the minus s nt. Now what we're going to do is we're going to replace the e to the st with a value of z. But we know that e to the st can also be written as e to the sigma plus i omega t. So that's the same as e to the sigma t times e to the i omega t. But this z here is just a complex number. That complex number can also be written in polar form as r e to the i theta. So the mapping here is going to be from the r e to the i theta to this value here, e to the sigma t, e to the i omega t. So the value of r is going to be the value e to the sigma t, and the value of our theta is going to be the value omega t. So these are the little mappings here. We have r equals e to the sigma t, and theta is equal to omega t. So these mappings here will map this rectangular complex plane onto the polar complex plane. And the values of our r here are going to be the circles, which are going to be exponentially separated. And the value of our theta is going to be our angle here, which are going to be a, a linear value given by omega t. So let's look and see how the points in the s plane map onto the points in the z plane. The i omega axis here occurs whenever sigma is equal to zero. So when sigma is equal to zero, we've got a 
circle here of constant radius of value of 1 and that's this circle here which is defined by the little pink section. So let's follow the points on this line here. We're going to have the central point here and that's going to be this point here and the next one up is going to be the cross which is the cross here and the next one up is the next cross and then there's the third cross. So these three crosses here are going to be these three here and then if you were to follow this along we're going to have this point here so we're going to have the circles now so we're going to have one two three four and the fifth circle so that's these five circles here one two three four five and of course that repeats continually because we know that the discrete time Laplace transform is going to be a periodic function so this same scenario here of the five dots and the three gets repeated up here so we get another five dots and another three and we get the three crosses here and the five dots down here so it's just a repetition of this. Now if we come along to the next vertical line here the next vertical line is going to be the next circle out so that's going to be this one and again we're going to have the three crosses and we're going to have the five dots and finally the third vertical line here is going to be the other three crosses and the other five dots. So now we can go from the discrete time Laplace transform which we've written here to the Z transform which we've written here and this is the forward Z transform so it's going from a function of time to a function of Z. Now we can see here how we got from this line here to this line here because our z is written as e to the st and e to the st is in here so the only thing that's left from this here is the value of minus n so we can replace this with f of n t z to the minus n so this is our z transform so lastly here we have the derivation of the inverse z transform now we're not going to have any need to use this and very seldom Will you see it in any engineering terms but I added it in here just for completeness so if we start off with the inverse Laplace transform which we looked at in a previous video it's written in this form here but now what we're going to do is we notice the the factor z is going to be equal e to the st so the complex number z is e to the st so it means that we can then rewrite this in terms of s so we can take the uh, the log of this side and the log of the natural log of this side and the natural log of that side there and then the natural log of e to the st would just be the value of st and this would be lnz so we then take the t down so you have 1 upon t lnz and then you can differentiate this here so ds by dz well the 1 upon t is just a constant so it stays the way it was and when we differentiate a uh, lnz with respect to z we just get 1 upon z and then we can take the dz up from the bottom and we get this here. Now if we plug these back into this equation up here then the 1 upon t cancels with the t here and the fs is going to be replaced with our f of z and the e to the st here gets replaced with our value of z so that'll be z to the power of n and then we've got this extra factor of this 1 upon z which becomes this z to the n minus 1 and that's all by dz. Now don't worry too much, oh, another thing to note here is that this is an integral round a closed loop because the integration here was in a Cartesian integration but now the, uh, we're integrating round about a, a closed loop so that represents this integration around the closed loop so don't worry too much if that seems a bit beyond you or you don't um, seem to uh, understand that I wouldn't expect you to understand all of that from that very quick simple explanation the reality of is, it is that if we want to study this type of mathematics it's better studying in a course on complex analysis and I will be doing a course on complex analysis sometime in early this year and this will be covered in it 
and it's quite handy to go through the course and complex analysis because all of the stuff that you really do in the Fourier and Laplace transforms really uh, came from uh, the branch of mathematics called complex analysis and it's a fascinating and a real interesting subject. So that's all there is for the derivation of the forward and inverse Z transform. Now we get a better understanding of why the Z transform is defined as it is whenever we start looking at the properties of the Z transform. So that's what we're going to go on to next and most importantly when we look at the idea of time shifting. So thank you for listening. I'll get you in the next video. Goodbye.